Hey everybody, today we are having a debate on the fossil record and we are starting right now. Ladies and gentlemen, thrilled to have you here for another epic debate. This is going to be a fun one, folks, and want to let you know, if it's your first time here, consider hitting that subscribe button as we have many more debates to come. So, for example, we're very excited that this Saturday, G-Man and Nathan Thompson will be debating against Fight the Flat Earth and Team Skeptic on the topic of evolution in a tag team debate. So, very exciting, folks, and want to let you know, we're a neutral platform, so we don't have any videos that take any particular sides regarding these issues we just let the debaters do that and a couple more things before we get started it's going to be a kind of a hybrid type of format today where each speaker will have six minutes for their opening statement then we'll have open conversation for 45 minutes and then q a for about 15 minutes want to let you know 100 of all of the super chats that come in today will be going to the cause of COVID relief. So we really do care about this. This is something we feel like unites us. No matter what walk of life you're from, I'm sure you care about getting medical products to the right people so that it hopefully will save lives. And so we really enjoy having you here, folks, and want to let you know, if you want to see the receipt for that donation, let me know. Even if it's your first time here, just shoot me an email and say, hey, James, can I see that? And I'll say, absolutely. We want to be fully transparent about that. With that... One also lets you know, because we have to respect the debater's time, we will not get to read every single Super Chat. So just want to give you a warning, and we will definitely not be reading Super Chats that are abusive toward our guests, who both have come on freely, just because they love to debate these topics. And so with that, we are going to jump into this debate. If you have a question, feel free to fire it into the old live chat, and if you do... If you tag at Modern Day Debate, that makes it easier for me to be sure that every single question gets in the list, at least. And Super Chat's an option, in which case you can not only ask a question, but also make a comment if you'd like that one of the speakers or both would get a chance to respond to. So with that, I want to say thanks so much to our guests for being here. As Like I said, we really appreciate it. They knew coming into this that this is going to be a fundraiser as we try to do one charity drive per month, and so we appreciate them helping make that possible. So thanks so much, Kent Hovind and David. We appreciate appreciate both of you being here with us. Thank you so much. Glad to be Thank here. You. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. And so with that, David, I am going to set the clock for six minutes, and the floor is all yours for your opening statement. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, James. And I'll share screen here. Okay. All right. Can y'all see my screen? Okay. Perfect. Excellent. Okay. So uh, today Kent and I are going to talk about the fossil record and whether or not we think it's evidence for evolution. And I take the position that it absolutely does. Um, but first I want to um, clarify something. Um, after talking with a few of my friends and friends around the area, I kind of get the impression that they think that there's a conflict between science and religion, uh, which is not true. Um, you know, for example, the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church and uh, the Methodist Church, they all openly accept evolution. And Pope Francis even describes it as um, just a, an intricate way that God decides to um, make things. Uh, it's just the physiology of exactly how he does it. So uh, I just want to clarify that from the beginning. And uh, here are a list of some uh, evolutionary scientists who are also theists. Uh, the three here are Ken Miller, which is on the top left, followed by Robert Bacher with the arm, and finally the director of the NIH uh, down there on the bottom right. Um, they're all um, theistic evolutionary uh, scientists. So um, I just want to clarify this again. Okay, so let's define what we mean by evolution. Uh, evolution is the change in genetic frequency in a population of organisms from one generation to another. Uh, I understand that Kent, you know, accepts that as well as, you know, most creationists. Um, uh, he just has a problem with how far it goes um, regarding, like, different kinds, but we don't really know what a kind is because it doesn't really have a definition. Um, he's given examples, but he just hasn't given, like, a clear-cut definition of it. Um, 
And again, microevolution is just like the picture that was shown before. Uh, it's just evolution on small scale uh, within a population. Kent, again, has no problem with this at all. Um, now, uh, interestingly, when looking at macroevolution, that is evolution at or above the level of species. And uh, as you can see, these uh, alligators and crocodiles here, um, those are all different um, species. All one of them are. Now, I, I presume that Kent would probably think that they're all the same kind, um, whatever that means. Um, but uh, they're different species, which means that they they cannot, or excuse me, they cannot produce fertile offspring. Um, and uh, like ligers, for example, ligers and mules are sterile, which means that um, they cannot have babies themselves. So that's why lions and tigers are a different species. Um, and uh, the same would be true for these crocodilians. Um, in, in fact, there are a few of them that could not even produce an infertile hybrid, such as the, alligator, the American alligator and the Nile crocodile, for example. Um, okay, so when looking at different transitional forms here, when looking from dinosaurs to birds, we have Archaeopteryx, which interestingly was discovered two years after Darwin published his book in 1859. Uh, it has, um, if you look at the top right picture, you'll see a Compsognathus. Um, which is, you know, everybody would accept that that's, that's a dinosaur. Um, but um, in the middle, you will see Archaeopteryx, and it has very, um, it has, you know, wings, or uh, it has um, arms similar to that of the chicken on the, on the right, but it also has three fingers, which no living bird alive today has those. And it also has a mouth with teeth and no beak, which, again, no living bird has that. Um, and it also has a long bony tail, just like the Compsognathus. Again, no living bird has that today. Um, and interestingly, uh, Fred Hoyle, he was a creationist himself, although a uniquely interesting one. He said that he thought that micro, or excuse me, that Archaeopteryx was just a Compsognathus type of dinosaur with feathers glued onto it, even though you can't really glue feathers, but that's another story. <laughs> Um, but it also, it's clearly, you know, very bird-like. A lot of creationists, you know, um, they will say that, you know, Archaeopteryx is just a bird, despite the dinosaur traits, such as the tail and the lack of the beak and the three fingers and so forth. And uh, Microraptor, another animal very, very similar to um, Archaeopteryx, uh, except that it had four wings and it is slightly, and it's younger, it's dated to be um, around 120 million years old. Um, it also had, oh yeah, I probably, I think I said it had four wings before. Um, so yeah, that's another interesting one. And uh, Cynornithosaurus was another uh, interesting uh, dinosaur, bird dinosaur, whatever you want to call it. It's a really good, these are really good transitional um, fossils. Um, Again, that's it lived around the time of Microraptor. It was just a little larger, and it might have even been venomous because I think it. I remember reading an article where it had venom sacs in its jaw, or, or something like that. I'm not exactly sure, but <laughs> all right. Um, and Cadipteryx is an, another interesting critter, um, very bird-like, uh, in that it had the tail and the wings. Uh, well, it had very weak looking wings. Um, obviously it couldn't fly with them. It's too big and those arms are, or those wings are too small, um, but clearly very bird-like, you know, it had that long tail also with feathers. And um, this is a very, very interesting looking critter. So, <laughs> okay, sure. All right, cool. Um, when looking at uh, Lucy or Australopithecus afarensis, we, that was, Pretty much the missing link that Darwin predicted in his book about um, like the link between modern apes and humans. Uh, it had a lot, it had a femur more like a modern human. That is these, the femur is this bone right here. It's uh, Lucy's is slanted right here. And a modern chimpanzee, which is on the very right, it is slanted outward, which means that Lucy was most likely bipedal, or at least at least some of the time. It was at least 
it may not have been fully bipedal, but it was at least, you know, an op uh, at least a habitual biped. Um, and it also had a, a pelvis more like that of a modern human, as well as a foramen magnum, which is the hole that connects the uh, skull to the um, the spinal cord. That's it's more like ours than it is any modern ape. So, <laughs> and uh, when looking at another, you know, ape to human transition or ape-like creatures to human. Cool. <laughs> With that, we are going to kick it over to Kent and thanks so much, Kent. The floor is all yours. Well, thank you. Can you go full screen on my slides like you did his? Yes, we can. If you hit share screen on your side, on Zoom. It doesn't do it that way. You're full screen. Just I am full screen on his. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I do a lot of debates on this topic, uh, creation versus evolution. I have been I became a Christian uh, 51 years ago, gave my heart to the Lord as a sophomore in high school. I take the position that the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate, and the evolution theory being forced down our kids' throats is the dumbest and most dangerous religion in the history of the world. There is zero evidence for evolution, especially from the fossil record, which we'll talk about in a minute. But David, I appreciate you coming on to defend your faith. That was indeed a faith you presented, a religious worldview. We don't know that Lucy had any children or any of those fossils. We'll talk about that in a minute. Our ministry, drdino.com, is in Lenox, Alabama. We have a Christian camp, a science center, a museum, everything free. Come on down. So David says the fossil record supports evolution, and he's going to use transitional fossils, and we got that here. I would like to point out for the record, Your Honor, there is no such thing as a fossil record. There are lots of fossils, lots of fossils. We have hundreds, maybe thousands in our museum. Come on down and see them. But they're not a record. None of the fossils talk. None of them have a date stamped on them. You're putting your interpretation on them. And I go through this on my seminar part four for a long time about the supposed fossil record there. It, well, I'll show you. If you find a fossil in the dirt, all you really know is it died. That's it. You could not prove it had any kids. You certainly could not prove it had any kids that lived. You could never prove it had different kinds of kids than its kind. In a court of law, every single, in an honest court of law, every fossil they bring in as evidence would be thrown out. All I'd say is, Your Honor, they found some bones in the dirt. They don't know that one had any children. Yep, you're right, throw it out. You sure don't know it had kids that were different. Yep, you're right, throw it out. And why would you claim a bone in the dirt can do something no animal today can do? No animal today produces anything other than its kind. Birds produce birds, frogs produce frogs, dogs produce dogs, there are no exceptions. David, I don't know who taught you this stuff, but get your money back. You got robbed, son. There is no evidence from the fossils of any changing from one kind to another. Is there any evidence of any fossils forming today? David, they find fossil graveyards with millions and maybe even a billion fossils in one graveyard. Something catastrophic happened to bury them. When they climbed Mount Everest 1953, same year I was born, they found fossilized clams on top of Mount Everest. And the clams are in the closed position. Well, now hold it. When a clam dies, it opens and something eats it. You can walk along the beach and find a million seashells. If you're from Jacksonville, go out, walk along the beach. You don't find closed clams once they die. You can bury a clam 15 feet deep in mud. It'll dig his way to the top. More than 15 feet, they don't make it. Typically, that's the boundary they set for them. So, how do you get petrified clams in the closed position by the millions on top of mountains all over the world? They find fossil clams and oysters with 11 foot clam shells, 11 feet. That's a big clam on top of the mountains in Peru. Now hold it. I would like to point out that first of all, clams don't climb mountains very well. 
Secondly, when they die, they open. How can these things be closed and petrified? We have thousands in our museum in Lenox, Alabama. Come on down. So I think you're simply seriously mistaken, uh, David. No fossils count as evidence for evolution. None. All you could prove is Archaeopteryx died. You don't know that Archaeopteryx had any kids, and you certainly don't know, don't know and couldn't prove it had kids that were different. You may believe that if you'd like, and you, you're welcome to believe this is America, the land of the free and the home of the slave. So you can believe anything you want, but that's not science. And I reject and resent the idea of them teaching that as science to, and forcing all the kids to learn that at taxpayer expense. If you wish to believe these Archaeopteryx and Lucy were missing link, you can believe that if you'd like. If you wish to teach other people that, you're welcome to do that. You want to force me to pay your salary while you do it? Now, there's where we're going to have a problem, son. You go start a private school and teach all about Lucy and Archaeopteryx and all this stuff to anybody that wants to pay and come learn it. But none of that has any business being in our public school tax-funded system. Why would you think a bone in the dirt can do something no animal today could do? Why don't we see it happen? See, the evolutionists will say, we don't see evolution happening because it happened long ago and far away, and it happens too slowly. Okay, then why don't we see in the fossils evidence of evolution where it's a clear pathway? They'll say, well, it happened too rapidly. There is no evidence anywhere on the planet of fossils forming today. How many animals died today? Millions. How many are going to fossilize? None. You can't prove any fossils are forming today. You certainly couldn't prove they're forming in vast numbers. You may find one, but there are billions of fossils in the ground. Look at the diatomaceous earth quarry or the limestone. Thick layers, 300 feet thick. I think there was a catastrophe. The fossils we find are clear evidence of a flood of a judgment on the planet where a bunch of stuff died at the same time. And I think the best explanation for the fossils at all is a flood. So let me see if I covered your stuff here. All these that you gave, dinosaurs to birds, apes to humans, fish to terror, but you couldn't prove any of them had any children. Case closed. You lost. You couldn't prove they had different children at all. You couldn't prove they had children that lived. And no animals today are doing this. So my contention is there is no such thing as a fossil record. It doesn't exist. There are lots of fossils, but it's not a record. None of them talk. There is no fossil record, but the textbooks teach this like it's some kind of fact. They put animals in some kind of order and say there's fossil evidence of evolution, like the whale, missing link. Arranging animals in order doesn't prove anything. I could put a bicycle, tricycle, and, and car side by side. I got a two-wheeler, three-wheeler, four-wheeler. What does that prove? Nothing. Proves I got extra time on my hands to do dumb stuff. Arranging things in order how you would like them to happen is not evidence. You can arrange them in all kinds of orders if you want. But what we see today is whales produce baby whales without exception. Now, if you wish to dream and imagine that it was different long ago and far away, you can. But my contention is there is no fossil record. It doesn't exist. That's one of the lies I cover on my video number four of my seminar series, Lies in the Textbooks is video four. The whole series is 18 hours long. You can get the whole thing for 50 bucks, take it home, copy it, return it, get your money back minus the shipping. You can't beat a deal like that. We want to get the gospel out. David, I'll send you video number four for free if you'll watch it. Contact my secretary, Yulia, 855-BIG-DINO, extension uh, two. And say, Doc said he would send me video number four for free if you'll promise to watch it. It's all about lies in the textbooks. Kind I think you've been brainwashed. There is no fossil record. There are simply left. bones in the dirt, and you don't look back in the fossil record. You look at the fossil record as it exists today in your hand. You're not looking back in time. Who taught you that? You're we putting your interpretation on them, and that's all it is. Dead animals do not reproduce or evolve. Done. Jump. Thank you. Thanks so much. We will jump into the open discussion section. So I want to let you know a couple of things, folks. I don't know if it's YouTube or our Lumia app, basically the light that lights up the studio. But for some reason, the screen is, I am aware that this, the screen is like tinted uh green or yellow on youtube working we are working on that so i don't know what it is like i said never seen that before so we are going to kick it over to open discussion though so gentlemen thanks so much for being here and the floor is all yours thank Go you ahead, so David. much 
All right. And then cool. one thing, David, uh, it's a okay, little bit so... one thing, David, it's a little bit harder to hear you. If you're able to maybe speak closer to your mic or just speak a little bit louder, that'll probably help balance it out. Okay. Is that better? That's definitely better. Okay, sure. So, sorry about that. No problem. Again, uh, thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Um, so Kent mentioned about how you can't prove that Apostle had any kids, and you couldn't prove that it had any kids that were different. Um, okay, but uh, Kent, you know that I've heard you say how you accept that like a wolf could gradually over time give rise to something like a pug or uh, a bulldog or something like that, right? Well, not, David, I'm not requiring that that be taught as science. I believe a dog and a wolf could have had a common ancestor, but that would be taken on faith. Nobody's ever seen a wolf produce a non-wolf. Uh, if somebody wishes to believe that, I think that's reasonable. But you want to believe a wolf and a butterfly have a common ancestor. That's completely unreasonable. Um, I, I don't think it's unreasonable. Um, okay. You believe what you want, but don't make me pay to teach that stupidity in our school system. Go start a private school. Well, well, I mean, what's, what's wrong with a religion, though? I mean, what's wrong with having... <laughs> it's a religion. It's a religious belief. It's not part of science. Science but means... But you're, you're saying that, are... like, having a religion is a bad thing. You're saying it is if it's no. a bad thing. No, religion's well, a wonderful thing. But is that going to be required right, yeah. in tax-funded schools? Do you want to teach all religions in the schools at taxpayers' oh, expense? Oh, okay, I, I see what you I see what you're saying. Um, but I mean, I, I so you you say that you believe it on faith that that like pugs and wolves have a common ancestor. You don't. Think I think that we that can reason? observe. It can be observed in, in human observations, the varieties of dogs that are produced. They can watch that happen at the kennel. I had a family come to my seminar one time. They've been in the kennel business for 100 years, three generations. And the lady told me, she said, we, we could take 20 or 30 generic mutts out of the dog pound, and through selective breeding, we could create every breed of dog on the planet today in 100 years. We could go from a generic mutt to a Great Dane or a Chihuahua. I believe that's probably true through selective breeding they could get all the variations of all the dogs. Okay, right. I'll assume as we, we observe variations happening in right. different things. Farmers try hard to breed their cows to get either more milk or more beef or more heat resistance or whatever they want for their climate. But mm -hmm. they always get a cow, no exceptions. It is a pure religious belief for you to believe that a cow and a butterfly and a mosquito have a common ancestor. And I don't care if you believe it, I don't care. I do care they wanna teach that in the schools as part of science. It's not science, I think it's dumb but it's okay. Have any religion you want. But evolution is nothing but a religion. We, it is logical to say the wolf and the dog might have had a common ancestor. There are thousands of similarities. It is mm -hmm. not logical to say the wolf and the butterfly have a common ancestor. I think that's completely illogical. Um, so about that, but you understand that like it would be gr a gradual transition like from a, you, you understand that like a wolf would, wouldn't immediately give birth to like a pug or something like that, right? Well, the gradual changes, can, when it comes to dogs, they can be observed over a couple of lifespans. I mean, 100 years of people selectively trying to breed something, especially if you get something with a short life cycle, like bacteria. You know, every 20 or 30 minutes, you get a new generation. Now, there they get a right. lot of variation in the bacteria, but they always get a bacteria every time. And you can watch right. thousands of generations happen in the laboratory in a few years. Thousands and thousands of generations, you can watch it happen. We do not watch the wolf slowly turn into the dog. And you, your statement that, well, Brother Hovind, you understand it's gradual. That's an evidence that it's a religion, David. You believe well, it might well, happen, but we can't see it happen. But if we can imagine SpongeBob style, maybe it happened gradually. How about, how about it didn't happen at all? Didn't um, happen at all. <laughs> um, well, I mean, do you, we don't necessarily have to directly witness something in order to conclude that it's, you know, to reasonably conclude that it happened. I mean, you know, we didn't well, witness. I think you need, to, you need to look up the definition of science. It comes from the well, Latin. I mean, you can't see atoms. Which, but... Science means see or what we know. Science is things gained by knowledge, gained by observation, experimentation, and testing. There is no observation. There is no experimentation. There is no testing to demonstrate the wolf and the butterfly have a common ancestor. Well, None. I would, There's I would no say fossils. that. Well, I mean, regarding the fossil record, the further back in time you go and the deeper in the um, 
in the earth you go, the simpler and more similar things appear to be. I mean, until they're virtually, you know, indistinguishable from one another. Um, and also, um, again, this this is kind of getting off the topic of fossils, but I think you know the genetic evidence for like you know elephants and pine trees or um, butterflies and uh, and bananas or something like that. The evidence for that is um, again, you know, looking back at the fossil record, but also in genetics, given that we're all made of, you know, that all life is based on DNA, um, which is also a, um, you know, it's what they use to determine, you know, a paternity test, you know, uh, which I would assume you would accept, right? Well, let me make a couple of comments on what you said. You said the further back in time we look, David, you cannot look back in time. You cannot do that. Well, well I mean, we, we date fossils oh. by radiometrically, though. That's how we oh. get the ages of fossils. That's what they told you. They lied to you. Get your money back for education, okay? You don't Why look would they lie to me? in the earth to get older. The, all of the layers on the planet, all of the layers are the same age. They taught you in school that the top layer is younger than the bottom layer. I say, really, where did this top layer come from? Outer space? Are the layers being added to the earth from outer space someplace? All the layers are the same age, all of them. They got shuffled up. You can get a jar of dirt and sand and rocks. And, and we do it here at a demonstration every day. I did it three times today, giving tours of our place. We got a jar with sand, gravel, rocks, mud, and water. You shake it up, set it down. In 30 seconds, it settles into layers. Gravel, sand, small sand, clay. Every time, same, same order. All of the layers are the same age. You don't look back in time when you dig deeper. All over the world, petrified trees are found that are standing up, connecting all these layers. We've got dozens of pictures in, my, in our museum and on my website, drdino.com, and in the video that I'll send you about the polystrata fossils. Let me go to that one. I got pictures of it here. Polystrata fossils. So here we go. Slide number 900. Oh, 3D, 900, page down. So I think you, it's sad that somebody taught you this, and it's sadder that you believed it. But that's okay, we can fix all that. You don't look back in time, nobody can. There is no fossil record, it doesn't exist. Here we go, I got it right here. Um, it, okay, slide it, number. You mean, there are Nine, fossils eight, that we find. What do you mean that there's no fossil record? There are fossils, but it's right. not a record. None of them talk, none of them have a date stamped on them. None of them. I got well, I mean, I, I, claim that none of do, talk. I claim that we do have, like, I mean, it's not written in English how old it is. I mean, it's used. It's not written at all. You're guessing. Well, Here's a petrified tree standing count, up. You know, is, we hang count on, David. The Can you see? Ratio of, I'm sorry. Go ahead. This, this petrified tree is standing up, running through multiple layers. Hundreds of these have been found. These are all in Joggins, Nova Scotia. There's quite a few in Tennessee. Petrified trees in the standing position. We have a sample in our museum of a petrified piece of wood running through 12 different layers of slate. Here's a guy standing by one, standing up, running through all the layers. There's a fish that was found with the nose stuck in rock, supposedly millions of years older than the head. I'm telling you, mm -hmm. the petrified trees in the vertical position show clearly all the layers had to form rapidly. Now, Noah's mm -hmm. flood would do that because the tide going up and down every six hours, 12 and a half minutes, would make the water rush in to fill the bump and rush out to empty the bump, making lateral movement. We do the demo right here at Dinosaur Adventureland. Come on down, I'll give you a tour. It's the lateral movement of the material that's gonna round all the rocks off and deposit layers every tide. These petrified trees you're seeing here standing up were probably buried in a couple of days before the wood could rot. Polystrate fossils, there, there, there are thousands of them. Um, had to be buried in a big flood. Let's see, I cover that. Oh, I got plenty of stuff on that. Uh, petrified trees in the standing position. So somebody taught you that you look back in time. No, you don't. They said they somebody taught you if you dig deeper, you're going back in time. No, you're not. You're digging deeper. That's all. All the layers are the same age. They all formed at the same time during Noah's flood. Fossils don't form today at all, certainly not significant numbers. So the flood of Noah is the logical solution for the problem, but I'm not asking for the Bible to be taught in schools. You guys are demanding that we pay to teach your religion, and I resent that. Go ahead. Okay, thanks, Ken. Okay, so uh, about the trees, um, I was looking up some articles about this on, um, especially on Talk Origins, where it talks about uh, how this is 
not exactly true and there are scientific explanations for why it appears to be that way um i would but, i would like to hear that for you to say there is is one thing show sure. me the scientific yeah. explanation right here sure i got pictures right uh pictures of right. that right go okay so oh i'm sorry you go to tennessee and see it for yourself cool um so according to mainstream models of sedimentary environments they are formed by rare to infrequent brief episodes of rapid sedimentation separated by long periods of either slow deposition non-deposition or a combination of both um, and upright fossils typically occur in layers associated with an activity or an actively uh, subsiding coastal plain or rift basin or with the accumulation of volcanic <clears throat> material around the periodically erupting stratovolcano. Oh, so, um, slow down now, David, one at a time. I know you're reading off Talk Origins. I'll debate every right. one of those guys with half right, my yeah, brain. Right, yeah, I'll, I'll admit that this is pretty complicated. No, it's um, not complicated yeah, it's, at all. No, it's not complicated. All those layers formed rapidly around a standing tree before it had a chance to fall over. A dead why tree would that, fall over in less than five years. Why is it that the scientific community doesn't embrace that, though? I mean, if that were oh. the case. It, you're going by majority opinion. If you go to a Muslim country, you'll find all the scientists in Muslim countries believe Allah was a great guy and, you know, and Muhammad well, was a great guy. And the fact that there's a majority of people that believe something doesn't make well, it true. Well, the majority, I mean, there's, uh, the majority of scientists in communist China right now, and they got way more scientists than we do in America, the majority of scientists in communist China believe communism is good. Does that make communism good? No, no. But the thing is, oh, the good. science... Okay. But the science, but science is peer reviewed, and you have to have others check your work. And you know, oh, virtually hey, the science only... in China, the science in China is peer reviewed too. Try to publish an article in China that says communism doesn't work. Try that. Try to publish an article in America that says evolution isn't true. See what happens. Okay. Um, well, I mean, um, the there is. Um, I'm a little, I'll admit that I'm the, the part about the trees is um, quite complicated um, about, you know. I think it's very simple, David, very simple. The Bible says in Second Peter chapter 3, at the end of time, the scoffers are going to be willingly ignorant of the creation and the flood. They oh, mention in Talk Origins that this is rapid sedimentation. I agree. Mm -hmm. Noah's flood would do that. You would get many layers deposited every day as the tide it, goes up and down. If it were like, if there, if it were all deposited in one global flood, then why do we not find like human and trilobite and dinosaur remains all in the same layers? Why do we never find them mixed in with each other? Well, great question. First of all, animals tend to be sorted based upon their body density. Mm -hmm. Birds are going to be found on top because birds are lighter. They have hollow feathers, hollow bones, and they're the last ones to die in a flood. So, of mm -hmm. course, the birds are going to be on top. Because nothing to do with evolution. Clams are going to be found at the bottom because they have heavier body density per square inch or per cubic inch. They have shells on them. And mm -hmm. they already live at the bottom. That's where they live. Of course, they're buried first. And plus, did you know they've never found human and chicken footprints in the same rock strata? Does, does that prove humans and chickens did not live at the same time? No. No, but... We got so, chickens. But if it were here. based... But, but if it were based on density, then wouldn't like sauropods and mammoths, wouldn't those be at the bottom instead? Like why are, you know, little dinosaurs like Compsognathus below, you know, large okay. sauropods, you know, like Google uh, the average body like density. Google, you just Google the average body density of reptiles. You'll find it's different than the average body density of mammals. But even then, I've got those little glass things you mm -hmm. flip over and make, it's called sand art. You can buy them at Walmart for 10 bucks. We have a demo we do here. It's got four different densities of sand in between the glass. It's got black, dark, blue, light, blue, and white. You flip it over. Mm -hmm. As the sand falls down, it makes 30 layers. Why would four different densities settle into 30 different layers? Just Google sand art. There's all kinds of pictures on the internet. This is the way water sorts things. Hydrologic mm -hmm. sorting. Each tide coming in and out would be... See, the, the evolutionists are stuck in their head that the layers are deposited vertically. No. Mm -hmm. It's horizontal movement of the water. If there was a tide covering the world, the tide would become harmonic if there were no interruptions. Now the tide starts coming up and it bangs into something like South America, North America, Africa. The tide gets interrupted. Just Google harmonic tide. A musician knows about harmonics. You pluck one string and three more start vibrating that you didn't even touch. If the earth were covered in water like the Bible says it was, 
the tide would become harmonic within a few weeks and it would be a 200 foot tidal change every six hours, 12 and a half minutes. So if the tide came up 200 feet, the water has to rush in sideways to fill that bump. And so the water is constantly moving sideways along the surface of the earth as the moon holds the bump there and the earth spins under it, the water effect to the people on earth, the water's going sideways. To the moon, it just sits there, holds the tide. It doesn't see any movement at all. It just holds the bump. So it's the lateral movement that would cause all of these layers to be formed very rapidly. But the Bible says the scoffers are willingly ignorant of the flood. You got taught the top layer is younger than the bottom layer. That is absolutely silly. All the layers are the same age. There's no such thing as a geologic column. You don't look back in time. All the layers were formed in a few weeks or months or a year max before the trees could rot. Sometimes the trees are petrified, standing up upside down, root end up. Now, how did that happen through the geologic column? I'm just telling you, it's sad that you got taught this. It's sadder that you believed it. And it's going to be really sad if you don't give it up after hearing the truth. You should give it up. There was a creation. There was a flood. No animal has ever produced any babies other than its kind. God said they would bring forth after their kind. Ask any farmer of vegetables or animals if that's what happens, and they'll tell you, yes, worldwide, universal. Cows what, produce cows, a, no exceptions. What's a kind, though? Well, what's a species? Nobody's got a solid oh, definition of a species either. A oh, wolf a and a dog are different. Is a group of organisms that can produce fertile offspring. Okay, can a wolf and a dog inter interbreed and produce fertile offspring? I believe so. Uh, yeah, they I can. Mean, they can. I'll tell them. you, they can. But the wolf and the dog mm -hmm. and the coyote are different species. Canis lupus, Canis domesticus, Canis coyote. Right. How come we have different species able right. to reproduce fertile offspring? I'm just telling you, David, the mm -hmm. definition of species is not rock solid in iron. Neither is the definition of kind. But the Bible said if they could bring forth, they're the same kind. I'll tell you this, a wolf and a butterfly cannot bring forth, and a wolf and a snake cannot bring forth, and a wolf and a mammoth mm -hmm. cannot bring forth. Those are different kinds, obviously. I don't know exactly where right. the line is, but keep in mind, I'm not asking my theory to be taught in the schools. I don't have to have a Oof. definition at all. You guys got to get the definition. You want me to pay for your religion to be taught. I resent that. So going back to the, is it okay if we go back to the um, thing, the picture of those crocodilians that I have? Oh, sure. Any, any pictures up you want. Yep. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thanks so much. Oh, yeah. Any time. So. Alligators, crocodiles, I agree. All right. They're the same kind of animal? I don't know. That'd be an interesting question for science to look at. I tell you this, alligators and butterflies are not the same kind. Now that I would say. Well, I mean, so, but right there. would you would you say that like, you know, like you say that like a five-year-old could tell that it's the same kind of animal, right? I, I think mean, a five-year-old or maybe even a three-year-old could tell you those are, they would probably call them all alligators. Uh, mm -hmm. And even if there might be a crocodile, slight difference. There are saltwater alligator, saltwater crocodiles and freshwater crocodiles. And they might've had a common ancestor called a crocodile. And they've had to learn to adapt to salt water. What you have there are mm -hmm. 11 different varieties of animals that I think it's pretty obvious they're not a bird and they're not a butterfly. But do you believe, David, that those crocodiles right. that you yeah. see are alligators in your picture have a common ancestor with butterflies and birds? Do you believe that? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're welcome to believe that. Well, it's I believe it because of the evidence. No, I mean, what evidence? Think... Oh, what the evidence? DNA, um, embryology. Okay. Um, begin the fossils. Um, uh, no, no, the fossils anything. offer no evidence at all. You can't use a single fossil as evidence, but DNA. Well, let's we, talk I, I claim that we can because it doesn't matter if, like, that, if, like, if we find a fossil of Lucy, I mean, it doesn't matter if that particular individual had any kids. You understand that, right? Because there were other animals around that that were, you know, of Lucy's species, right? David, you understand in a court of law, they would laugh at that and say, I'm sorry, you have to prove that one. You're claiming that no, one. No, no, I'm not, not claiming that Lucy, that particular individual, is, you know, ancestral. I'm yes, just you are. No, you are claiming uh, Lucy is a missing link. No, you are claiming well, no, that Well, Lucy I'm not saying that all of modern humanity is descended from that one individual. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that no. it... I know you did, I'm saying but you did claim that Lucy... Oh, you did claim Lucy is a missing link. You don't know Lucy has yes, any children. Absolutely. Try again. Well, Lucy does have a mosaic so of my, you know what point. people traditionally think of as apes, and um, what you know it, she has like a combination of ape and human characteristics, like the slanted femur. The she had a pelvis more like us, and she was bipedal. 
um, at least a habitual biped, as well as, you know, she had a form and magnum that was more like ours. Um, so she was definitely, you, know, you could consider her a missing link. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that and Homo erectus. David, would, you uh, can consider it a missing link because you want to believe this stuff. I don't consider um, Lucy evidence for anything other than it died. And if Lucy was, she was three feet tall, three feet, mm -hmm. no foot mm -hmm. bones were found at all, none. Right, but, but we do, like, but they put, but we do like have footprints. We do have the Latoli footprints, though, and those are dated to and be you, around the same time frame that you know, uh, as Afarensis. So it's okay. Reasonable. And you know how? To, I, hang on now. Do you know that those footprints came from Lucy? Not that particular individual, but one of her species, most likely. Yeah. How, how do you know that? How do you know that? If all you find are footprints, no bones at all, just footprints, what should you conclude? Mm -hmm. Somebody walked in the well, mud and left their footprints. Well, we haven't found any modern humans remains that old. So here I mean, you are again, you're assuming that the depth that they're found means something and it doesn't. The, all mm -hmm. those layers formed in one big flood, almost all, maybe, maybe even all the fossils, but certainly most all the fossils in the world formed in that one year flood in the days of Noah. There are billions and maybe tri probably trillions if you count the diatomaceous earth and the chalk cliffs, trillions of fossils in the world. No mm -hmm. question. They died mm -hmm. a rapid burial. They were preserved. How many animals died today? We got deer who get killed every day here in Lenox, Alabama area in lower Alabama. Somebody hits a deer. None of them are going to fossilize. None. The buzzards carry them around. The coyotes drag them around. The, it, fossils simply don't form in any observable numbers today. But you have been taught to believe that fossils somehow answers the question. No, they don't. Fossils are evidence of rapid burial, especially when you find clams that are closed buried on top of the mountains. When a clam dies, it opens. Go walk along the beach in Jacksonville. You find a billion seashells. None of them are closed. We've well, got I mean, if you of find clams, clams closed. Well, go ahead. well, if you find clams on top of the on top of like Mount Everest or wherever, I mean, yeah. wouldn't it be to conclude that you know that wasn't as high as it was you know if mount everest well, wasn't mount as, everest you know, tall right oh yeah I, I cover this in my seminar none of the mountains were there during the flood the mountains arose during the last part of the flood if we I filled think, this room i mean if we filled this room three feet deep in water and lifted up one end of the house if we lift up one end of the house all the water is going to run to the other end now the mm -hmm. water's still in the house it's just deeper over here than it is here. This part's out of, the, out of the ground. It's interesting, out of the water. All the mountain ranges in the world follow coastlines. Mm -hmm. The Appalachian Mountains all up and down the East Coast, why do they follow the coastline? App uh, Rocky Mountains follow the Pacific. The Andes Mountains follow the South Pacific. The Alps follow the Mediterranean. I believe during the flood in the days of Noah, everything was covered. Thousands of feet of mud layers were deposited with billions of dead things. Then Psalm 104 says, toward the end of the flood, the mountains lifted up and the valley sank down and the water rushed off. All the water from Noah's flood is still here. The earth is 70% underwater. Mm -hmm. And the part that's sticking above water is loaded with layers that we can see. You go to Grand Canyon, you can see thousands of layers and those layers are loaded with fossils and they connect to different layers above and below them. David, I'm sorry, you got really brainwashed in your education those layers are evidence of Noah's flood, rapid burial. They find fossilized octopus, squid, jellyfish. They don't have any bones at all. How do you fossilize something soft tissue? You've got to bury that thing within a couple hours of it dying. They find fossil fish struggling to get air with their uh, animals, with their arch, ne neck arched back, like they're swimming in heavily sediment-laden water. The evidence from the, I taught earth science 15 years, all the evidence we see from the earth is screaming at us. There was a flood that drowned all this stuff. So I'm sorry, there is, there's no such thing as a fossil record, which is the purpose of the debate tonight. And no fossils count at all. None of them talk, none have a date on them. None have been seen to produce a different kind of offspring. No animal today can do it. Well, I mean, so back to the, is it, if we, is it okay if we go talk about kinds again? Oh, sure, anything you want. Yep. Okay, thanks so much, thanks. Um, so again, like with the crocodilians, uh, you said that like a kind is anything that can bring forth. Is that correct? Well, the Bible says 10 different times in the first uh, six chapters, the animals will bring forth after their kind. 
-hmm. Certainly, uh, Great Danes and Chihuahuas, they would have a difficult time maybe, but they could bring forth a puppy. Uh, mm -hmm. Great Danes and butterflies cannot. Where exactly the line is for kind in every instance, I don't know. I don't care. Doesn't matter. I'm not so, asking mine to be. Right. Um, but okay, so like looking at dogs, for example, um, the African wild dog or the uh, painted dog, um, that is so distinct from um, domestic dogs and from um, wolves that it, they can't even produce an infertile hybrid. So okay. by that logic, it, it may be that. Same. Right. It could be in the last 4,400 years since the flood, the animals in the dog kind have diversified to where now they can no longer interbreed. I know we have the Kaibab squirrels and the Abert squirrels on opposite sides of Grand Canyon. They can't get across the river to even try, but my understanding is they can't interbreed and produce fertile squirrel. They're still squirrels. That's called a ring species. They're still the same kind. Any four-year-old will tell you, that's a squirrel and that's a squirrel. Now, the fact no, that they but can't I mean, interbreed as a result of 4,400 years of isolation, maybe no, but I mean, the African, the African wild dog, wild American dog, dog not they're not a butterfly. Like a David, they're not a butterfly. Go we got a, what was that, okay, what was that point from David? Go ahead, David. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, the African wild dog it cannot even it can't even produce an infertile hybrid, so it can't even produce you know, like if they mate they won't make any anything. So sure. I mean, by that logic they wouldn't be the same kind. So. Well, today they are not able infertile. You want to go back in time in your imagination. Let's go back in time. Could the ancestor of the African dog and the ancestor of the American uh, beagle? Mm -hmm. Could they have produced fertile offspring? Did they somewhere along the line uh, lose, the ability, lose the ability to reproduce fertile offspring? Or uh, maybe yes. they've developed some unusual traits uh, from living in a certain yeah. climate. But yeah. they're still a dog. They're still a dog. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. Because they've diversified to the point where they cannot produce, you know, a, a, even a hybrid for that matter. Like, you know, sure. cheetahs and lions can't produce a, a hybrid. So, I mean, you accept that, you know, at one point in the past, they were able to, you know, like with, you know. I believe, I believe the cats, the cheetah, the lion, the tiger had a common ancestor. I don't know. Maybe there were several kinds of cats on Noah's Ark. Maybe there's more than one variety, more than one kind. I don't know. But you want me to pay to teach the kids that the butterfly and the cat are related. That's well, there's dumb. evidence for that. I resent that. Well, there's evidence for it. I mean, there is what genetics. evidence? Oh, uh, probably for that, what you're talking about is probably uh, genetics. That's probably the most compelling thing uh, because DNA, okay. it's well, you know, what we use to yeah, determine. You mentioned DNA four or five times. I wrote it down to get a chance to get to it. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Mm -hmm. That is the gene code. That's the code to, to make a person or to make a cell. Humans have about 100 trillion cells in one body. Okay? Each of those cells contains 46 chromosomes, DNA strands, except for the gametes, they've got 23. So mm -hmm. those DNA is such an incredibly complicated code. It is mind boggling. Mm -hmm. And there are similarities. I think that proves the same guy wrote the code. I think if you could decipher it, you would see the code for Microsoft Word has thousands of identical lines to Microsoft PowerPoint. Well, what does that except, prove? Well, the Timothy Paul from Morse code? Well, well, except that DNA it um, is um, what, what is it? Yeah, DNA or RNA is self-replicating, I believe. Um, like with regards to like uh, transcription and translation and that kind of stuff. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. My my biology is a little rusty, so. <laughs> well, my uh, but you know DNA. Is not, it, I taught biology. 50. Oh sure. Okay, yeah, um, my biology is not. Rusty. But again, not like. Hey, David, I'm sorry? The DNA code is mind-boggling in its complexity. If you took a Microsoft PowerPoint program, are you you, are you computer literate? You know about computers and how they work, right? Okay. Let's take Microsoft PowerPoint. Let's save it onto a disk. Then let's load it into another computer, mm -hmm. copy it, and take that copy and save it to another disk. How many times could we copy a program like Microsoft before it corrupted? Is there a chance that in the copying process, after trying to copy off a copy, off a copy, off a copy, off a copy, eventually some corruptions would come in and you may lose some features. Like maybe it won't have spell check or it won't have you know, font size or 
Of course. The fact mm -hmm. that we have seen animals today that have lost a few features mm -hmm. from the original great, 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 great grandpa is not evidence for evolution. The DNA and the RNA, ribonucleic acid, are incredibly designed. If you walked along the beach and you found John Loves Mary written on the sand, it's nothing but sand grains. There's nothing there but sand grains, but they've been arranged in a particular order to give a message. Mm -hmm. Nobody with one eye and half a brain would say the waves wrote that in the sand or the seagulls wrote it. John wrote it. Now, whether that's smart to love Mary or not, it's a different story. But the fact is, when you see a message written in sand, you know somebody wrote this message. It's nothing but sand. The DNA and the RNA is nothing but the CATG arranged in certain order to produce a message. It would be insane to believe the DNA happened by chance over billions of years, and it all came from a rock, which came from the soup, no, which no. came from a dot. No, no. I think the whole thing. No one. No, nobody ahead. ever says that we came from a rock, though. That's that's. No one ever said that we came from a rock. I mean, it's what textbook has that in, in there? I think I've sh I've shown this probably thirty times on my YouTube channel, Kent Hovind Official, straight mm -hmm. from the textbooks, that the Earth began as a hot ball of rock. Do okay. you believe that? Uh I'm not sure. I'd have to see it for myself, honestly. Okay. Yeah. Well, Google it. 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth cooled down and became a hot ball of rock. Then as it cooled, it began to rain, and it rained on these rocks. And the minerals from the rocks got into the water and made a soup. And that soup, um, prebiotic soup, came alive. So we came from a rock. That is what they teach. <laughs> I'm telling you, it is. No, I show no, it 20 no. times. OK, I'll call up some slides to demonstrate that. Okay, but that you. is what they teach. Okay, uh, go All ahead. You right, teach for a while. Thank you. <laughs> if I can find it here, so I would say DNA is nothing but evidence for creation. That it incredibly complex. Well, I agree. It's very, very complicated. And um, but you think it happened by chance? Oh uh, no, I, I, don't, I don't think so. And um, I, I should have clarified. I'm I'm not an atheist, so. I, um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not gonna, you know, talk about, I'm not gonna, you know, talk about, you know, um, or what's the, what's the word? Um, I, I don't necessarily disagree with you, uh, about it being complex. Um, and I think that maybe even, you know, um, but I also accept that like DNA, it's, you know, used for, um, you know, I mean, we, we use it, I mean, you accept a paternity test and they do the exact same types of tests that they use on, um, you know, to determine if you're the father of somebody. It's just, they oh, extrapolate yeah, absolutely. It. Right. See, and they extrapolate it further back, you know, with. Um, you, you cannot go back in time. You can imagine if you'd like. Here we go. Slide number no, I two mean, and 30. Well, I mean, so again, like looking at, you know, like our relationship with other organisms, like with the other great apes. You know, um, we find that their DNA is like 95 to 98 percent, or, or I don't remember the exact percent, but it's good point. Let's let's let, let's hammer that for a minute. Could that be that the same guy wrote the code for both of them? Could it be that the apes and the humans have similar duties to do in life, like see in front of them but, and hear but, and walk and digest food? But, it would be the same but, code. But if you accept that humans, or, or excuse me, if you accept that DNA is like it's a, it helps you know give hereditary information. Like when does it stop being hereditary, and when does it start being like an indicator of design? That's what I'm confused. Well, about. it's just like the sand grains on the beach that say John loves Mary. I think it's obvious this these sand grains have been arranged to carry a message. The DNA, the chemicals right, in the DNA both, are carrying a message. But, what saying, but why couldn't I say, I mean, why couldn't it be both? Why couldn't God, you know, use, um, because it is well, very yeah. We have about five more minutes, and then we let's, will go into Q&A. All right, let's say it could be both. How come we're all paying for have your option to be taught and not both options? Well, because there's evidence for it, and DNA is a hereditary. You say that. No, there isn't. Yes, there, yes, there's, there's, there's evidence. evidence. 
DNA is more complicated than any program ever written by man combined. One cell well, in your body, and you got a hundred trillion of them. One cell contains more information than all the books ever written by man combined. Mm -hmm. What is the chances of ink falling on the paper, making a word, let alone a book? It's zero. And oh, is this the DNA tornado in the junkyard chance. analogy? Is this What's the that? tornado in the junkyard analogy by any chance? Well, that, that's another example. Junkyards don't, uh, tornadoes don't assemble cars in junkyards. They tear right, them apart. right. Um, let, me, let, me, let me answer the question from a minute ago, and then you can have the time. This textbook, sure. Holt Biology, or Glencoe Biology, says the Earth formed 4.6 billion years ago. It was a hot ball of rock. Okay. okay. Millions of years ago, rains created the oceans. Earth started as a ball of very, very hot liquid, liquid rock, which cooled down. A few oh, hundred rock million is years. not liquid, though. Rock well, liquid is solid. Rock. Well, if you get rock hot enough, it turns to a liquid. It's called magma. So right. a few hundred million years ago, the Earth reached 2,000 degrees, the melting point of iron, and Earth's core was formed. Earth formed mm -hmm. 4.54 billion years ago. I have hundreds of quotes swirling in the waters of the oceans of these, was these chemicals that came alive. So yes, you do believe where the where did those chemicals come not, from? That though? you came from a rock. Where did the, where did those chemicals come from though? From the rocks. Where does it say that? You tell me if it's raining on the rocks and now the rain produces oceans and the oceans contain chemicals. Where did the chemicals come from? Water's only got two: hydrogen and oxygen. Where mm -hmm. did the, life has a whole lot more than that? Where did the carbon come from? That I'm not exactly sure, but. So if life does form on a rock, does that mean it comes from a rock? I mean, so well, if, if the oceans contained prebiotic soup, they call it primordial soup. Here it is from the internet, mm -hmm. downloaded a couple of months ago. Okay. So 4.2 billion years ago. The soup, okay. What does primordial soup consist of? How life on earth first bloomed 3.7 billion years ago when chemical compounds in a primordial soup somehow sparked to life. This is LiveScience.com. The internet's full of this. The textbooks are full of this. And it's complete propaganda because they started as a hot ball of rock. It rained on the rocks, turned them into soup, and the soup came alive. Yes, David, you believe you came from a rock. So Just be proud of it. And quit wait, driving on the highway because that's made out of your ancestors. That ought to well, be rocks are not alive. So, I mean, it couldn't be an ancestor because rocks are not living. I agree. The chemicals in the rocks leached into the water. The first self-replicating well, so system. So those chemicals themselves, are those chemicals themselves that got in the water? Are those chemicals themselves rock? Well, rocks are made up of all sorts of different elements. Might be a right, right, more. right. But right. being, but those chemicals themselves, not the entire rock, just those chemicals. Are those chemicals themselves rock? Well, pieces, little tiny pieces of the rock elements from no, the rock. no no so the rock is the the, water. got a one once oh, one okay. of you is ready to defer to the other uh, i will bring us into the q a so i uh, okay. know that we could always keep going but we will have I to think just we, uh, kick, we kick this dog enough i think the, the audience sees clearly that he does believe he came from a rock the textbooks certainly teach that but he, he'll never admit it but go ahead uh, yeah no no textbook said that we came from a rock that's just a favorite straw man you know? We're going to jump into the Q and A, folks. So, okay. let me put them up on screen again. Want to say appreciate all of your questions, folks. And as mentioned, a couple of things I had mentioned earlier. One, I have no idea why our screen is yellowish. I am baffled. Next, very excited to also mention. <laughs> The guests are linked in the description, and so you can always hear more by clicking on their links below. And want to say, 100% of our Super Chats today will be going to COVID-19 relief efforts. And so we want to say thanks so much for supporting that great cause. It really means a lot as we get to partner together, no matter what walk of life you're from. And so we'll get into these questions. And as mentioned, I put a disclaimer even in the description, in addition to mentioning at the start, because the we want to respect the time of the debaters, we will not be able to read every Super Chat. We will only have a strict 15 minutes of Q&A, and then we will have to wrap up. And with that, thanks so much for your Super Chat. Let's see. <clears throat> Sangheli Kalim, thanks for your Super Chat, said, 
To Kent, if the flood model for geologic stratum is correct, why haven't we found fossilized tree roots in Precambrian rock or even Cambrian? Well, I would point out, first of all, there's no such thing as Cambrian rock. There's no such thing as a geologic column. You cannot find it anywhere in the world except the textbooks. And I taught earth science 15 years. There's no such thing as a Cambrian layer. No such thing as a Jurassic, Triassic, Mississippian, Devonian, Silurian. It's all baloney. It's all imagination. But when trees are broken or ripped up in a flood, it quite often rips them up and rips the roots off. This happened in Mount St. Helens. The explosion of the volcano blew 20,000 trees into Spirit Lake. They're floating in there in the upright position, some upside down. And those had to, uh, let's see, open right here. They were ripped off and just partial roots, broken roots. The trees that I showed, I'll get back up here. Uh, my mouse working. Uh, here we go. Slide number 995. Alt DV 995. There. These trees are quite often shown with the roots ripped off. During a flood, you would it, it'd be catastrophic what would happen to the trees. Of course, you're going to lose the roots if they get ripped out of the ground. But trees have been found fossilized with stumps and roots on them. I've got pictures of some here somewhere. Let's see. So I think the evidence would be very clear. This was some kind of massive flood that did this uh, and floated them around. The trees from Mount St. Helens are still floating in that lake. For, what, 30 years after the volcano blew up, uh, they're still floating, many in the upright position because the root end gets heavier and it's waterlogged and they sink to the bottom and they stick in the mud at the bottom of Spirit Lake. Scuba divers went down there many times and say, look, there are thousands of trees standing up in the bottom of this lake. None of them grew there. None. They were blown in by a volcano. So go ahead. Next up, thanks to your super chat from, let's see, Bent, uh, spelled B-E-N-T, said, for Kent Hovind, so let's say you found a skeleton. How would you tell if it's a dinosaur? You personally... How would you decide? Well, I think very, very frequently, skeletons are found fully intact. And you can look at it and tell what it is. Uh, we can see deer skeletons laying along the road here and say, that's a deer, because I've seen lots of deer. Now, how would I personally, I may not know the exact name because there's so many different kinds of dinosaurs, varieties of dinosaurs. But if you just find a single bone, sometimes it gets tough. A good anatomist can find one single human bone and say, aha, that's the left little finger bone from a woman. I mean, if they're really good at it, but I don't care about that kind of stuff. So I think the bones that are found indicate they died, indicate they were rapid, rapidly buried, or they would have been dragged around, I mean, uh, the woods. I mean, to find an in a complete intact articulated skeleton is indication of rapid burial. Because the it. buzzards didn't get to it, the, the coyotes didn't get to it, it was buried completely intact. Had to be something like a flood. Gotcha. And thanks for your super chat from Woody, who uh, just sent a picture of a heart. Thanks for your support and love, Woody. Bella Charge, thanks for your su your super chat. Said, I'm not prepared for that. I don't know if they're talking about the screen changing colors on our end, but we appreciate. No, I do. I do. Hang on. Uh, in a couple, a debate I did some months ago. He was asking about some topic that uh, I had never anybody heard anybody use for evolution. And I said, well, I'm not prepared for that. Turns out it's not evidence for evolution at all. This has been answered many times, but they're going to ride that into the grave. Uh, I'm not prepared for that. I, I, I'm not prepared to talk about, uh, let's see, uh, how many horsepower the Russian missiles produce either. I don't, I don't know. I'm not prepared for that. I could get prepared. I could find out. But no, I'm prepared now if they want to bring it up again. Uh, some guy named the uh, something pussy or cat, uh, conspiracy cats, mm -hmm. said, uh, that, uh, you know, you, I said, I'm not prepared for that question, but I am now, and it's a big deal. I tell you what, when Judgment Day comes and you're going to die, hope you're prepared for that. Gotcha. Go and thanks for your super chat from Jen S., who said, join the Modern Day Debate Patreon to support this channel. Thanks, Jen. Totally appreciate it. We do have a Patreon linked in the description, folks. And thanks. Jesus is Lard says... Uh, congrats on the channel grow. Thanks for that. Appreciate your super chat. Dwayne Burke, thanks for your super chat, said, no one can determine if a fossil is an animal in transition or just an undiscovered pre-existent animal. 
So fossils aren't evidence for evolution, and they uh, said this is for David. Oh, um, so uh, that's interesting. Um, interesting point. Um, so again, when looking at Archaeopteryx, um, uh, would uh, would it be okay if I shared my screen again? Yes. All right. Cool. Thanks. Okay. When looking at Archaeopteryx. Um, we can see that um, it's clearly very bird-like. Um, you know, it had feathers. Um, it also had a long bony tail like a dinosaur and also three fingers like a dinosaur um, or what we think of as dinosaurs. Um, it also had um, a reptilian face with no beak and, a te and some teeth. Um, and no modern birds have those. Um, so it's like, I don't understand, like, why would God make a creature like this? You know, like, I don't understand that. Like, why would he make it, you know, make like a hybrid of like a, you know, this chicken and this compsognathus? Or well, not a hybrid, but like, um, you know, a transitional looking um, animal. Why would he make that? You know. I'm assuming that question is for me. Uh, can I get to answer that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. My bad. Yeah, that was fail on my part. Well, it depends what you mean by evolution. And I know, I think most of them are sincere. They really believe that. Are all the uh, Chinese scientists who teach communism, are they lying? No, they really believe that. They've been taught, to, they've been indoctrinated and brainwashed into really believing it. So you couldn't accuse, some may be lying, but I don't think you could accuse them of lying. I think you could accuse them of being wrong. You could accuse them of being brainwashed. That's for sure. That's been the history of science. They've, all through history of science, they've taught things that are crazy and later said, wow, that wasn't true. So, uh, no, they're not. I, I, don't, I don't know of any that are deliberately lying. Uh, I think they just really are brainwashed into believing that. And I'm trying to fix it. I'm here to help. Call 855-BIG-DINO, extension 3. I'll help unbrainwash you. Gotcha. And thanks for your super chat, Marty Camijo. I don't fully understand this question. They asked, what does having children have to do with being fossilized? I know that this is, I think it's referring to something that you had mentioned, Kent, but I, I don't know why, what they're... No, oh, it's, I think it's obvious to a kindergartner. You cannot prove that fossil had any children. Can you? No, but it doesn't okay. really... Hold on one sec, just to... Case closed. Next up... I rest my case. Thanks for your super chat. Listen, one, I think somebody asked, they're asking about... Uh, a phrase that you mentioned earlier in the debate, Kent. They said, Kent, did you say at 433 that America is the land of the free and home of the brave? Are you standing by the Bible slavery laws of the right to own people? I think well, they're that's asking way off mean. topic. Way off topic on the debate tonight. I said the land of the fee and the home of the slave because America has become uh, way, a long ways away from what our founders intended. The guys who started this country said we hold these truths to be self-evident all men are created equal they're endowed by their creator with certain rights where do rights come from if evolution is true if there's no creator where do rights come from i think you'll find a quick descent into slavery is is coming because of the stupid re rejection of a creator god gives certain rights unalienable rights so go ahead I just to, um, so sorry to do this to you, David, but um, we do I'm have sorry. a lot of questions that I, I, just because the question was targeted at oh, Kent, sure. I don't want to have it kind of be a gang up. Fran Tompkins, thanks for your super chat, said, thanks, Kent, for your book, Claws, Jaws, and Dinosaurs. And then they asked if you had written the book. I did. I wrote, it's the first book I wrote. I've written 67 books now. I wrote that book in 99 about dinosaurs that may still be living. There have been many expeditions in various swamps and jungles say, look, there are probably some dinosaurs. You show a picture of an apatosaurus to the natives in the Congo swamp, they'll say, oh, that's Mokali Mbembe. Don't get close. He's not friendly. 
Gotcha. Why would they say that? You got it. And thanks for your super chat. Sigifredo Sarabia is back again. Asked, uh, can, can a pug, the dog breed, come from a non-pug? How so? Or why could it not happen? Well, I think everybody would agree. If you turned all the pugs in the world loose into the woods, none of them would survive for a week. Most of them wouldn't survive two days. Most of the fancy breeds of dogs that man has developed wouldn't survive on their own. Natural selection would wipe them out. They're artificially kept alive because of human protection. So no, somewhere along the line, I bet if we went back in history, we could find a time when there were no pugs, none. Somebody had a mutated dog where the bones of the nose were caved in a little bit and said, oh, I'm gonna capitalize on this. I'm gonna try to get this dog to produce more puppies. And they, the pug was developed with human intervention but it's a completely useless dog, in my humble, totally unbiased opinion. Completely useless. Gotcha. Except to laugh at. Go we, next up, uh, we got one for David. Uh, this is rare that we get one for someone other than, usually Ken Oven gets all the uh, questions. But Dwayne Burke says, Archaeopteryx is a reptile with wings and classified as a dinosaur. But why is a pterodactyl? that is also a reptile with wings, not classified as a dinosaur? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so from what I understand, uh, dinosaurs, crocodilians, birds, they're all in the uh, archosaur clade, uh, which is, um, you know, it's a, a clade is like uh, the kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, that kind of stuff. Um, from what I understand, uh, pterosaurs are... They're a different. They're a sister group to dinosaurs. I'm not exactly sure why, but I think it has one of the reasons is that their legs are splayed out, or their limbs are splayed out to the side, so they don't qualify as dinosaurs. I think that's that's a really it's a really simple answer. There's a lot more to it though. I'm sure. Gotcha. And Mike Billars, thanks for your super chat. I think this is a, a challenge for you, Ken Hoven, where they were. I think earlier it came up of why don't creationists publish more in peer-reviewed journals and they said uh peer review is international so why not publish in a peer-reviewed journal from china do you think a peer-reviewed journal in china would publish an article claiming there's a creator all of communism is based on the philosophy there are no rights that come from god rights come from government that's the foundation of communism there's no higher authority if you get a bunch of people together who believe they have rights that come from God, they're going to throw the tea in the harbor and start a big war. You can't have people believe in that. So no, peer reviewed, the whole idea is silly. That a, because this All through history, we've seen changes in what the majority believes. Look at the age of the earth. Just 30 years ago, they were teaching it's 18 billion years old in peer reviewed, peer -reviewed journals. Now they're teaching 13.7. Well, what happened to the 5 billion years? It's tentative. It's tentative. It's really? subject. Yeah. We're getting closer, though. It's really 6,000. Just, just because no. we have little time, I do want to keep moving. And thanks for your super chat from Robert Luscombe, who said, James, did you thoroughly screen these interlocutors? <laughs> uh, it's referring to another debater that always asks me that. Um, Area 55, or a Area 85 restorations, thanks for your super chat, said, Kent, humans and chicken fossils aren't found in the same layer because chickens hadn't evolved from the jungle fowl yet. Humans and the jungle fowl are are found in the same layers. Thanks for proving evolution. I would like to point out to Mr. 85, whatever that means, chickens and humans are still alive today. Today. We have a bunch in Dinosaur Adventure Land. Come on down. So we haven't found human and chicken fossils together because humans and chickens don't normally hang out together. And if there was a flood that destroyed a bunch of animals, the humans and chickens would settle into different layers because of the different body density. Most birds that can fly would fly around and avoid drowning till the last minute. So of course, birds are gonna be found on top of these layers of strata. It has nothing to do with evolution. It has everything to do with body density, intelligence, and mobility. Silly to believe that it somehow proved the order of burial proves some kind of connection. Absolutely insane for somebody to believe something so dumb. Next up, oh, is, it, 
Is it okay we, if I interject real quick? I think the challenge is we have limited time to read everybody's super I, chats that they sent. And then we also, I don't want to have it be any sort of like two on one. And so, uh, right. given that the last super chat was for Kent, then general, uh, the general is here. Thanks for your super chat said, Kent, do you completely deny geological gradualism and believe that all major geographical such as mountains, such uh, that all major geographical features were created by one ca catastrophic event, the flood. Oh, no. I think probably 90% of it was. There's gradualism happening today. We have erosion that's washing the soil down into the rivers. We have sedimentation going on in the oceans and lakes and river. No, gradualism certainly happens, but I think the vast majority of the features we see could easily be explained by one big giant flood. No, that's a trick question. They're trying to get trap me into saying something. I've never said that. Wouldn't believe that. Certainly gradualism happens, but you can't explain everything with gradualism. You can't explain a petrified tree standing up through 30 layers with gradualism. The tree would rot and fall over. Gotcha. And thanks for your super chat from, let's see, we have... One second. So sorry about that. I am finding this one. You have a, let's see. Oh, okay. Kang024, thanks for your super chat, said, question for Kent, please explain pesticide-resistant insects. Pesticides are sprayed on a 10,000 mosquitoes, let's say, and 20 of them survive because of usually something broken in their gene code. If you went through and handcuffed everybody to haul them off to jail, those that don't have hands or arms could not get handcuffed. So therefore they would survive and they might produce the next generation. And eventually you could get a whole herd of people that are, don't have arms because they couldn't get handcuffed. So a pesticide, every pesticide resistance is built up in just about anything, uh, any, uh, certainly in insects, it happens all the time because they have a short generation span, but it's still the same kind of animal. It's a mosquito or whatever you're trying to kill. And what they have is usually a deformed version that survives. It's, not, it's certainly nothing improved. Nothing got better because of this. Show me an example where this is evidence for evolution that something actually improved. I want to see that. Gotcha. And with that, we are coming to an end of our time. We do want to respect the time of the speakers as well as want to say just a couple of quick things before we do go. Thanks so much to everybody for your questions, for watching today. It's always fun to just be here together. Thanks for contributing to the cause as we uh, kind of gather in together to try to unify and make a hopefully a positive difference in light of COVID-19. And thanks to our speakers for making that possible as well as Kent Hoven and David have come here and they have got plenty of channels that they would... Uh, huh? They have plenty of channels that would love to have them. And so we really appreciate them spending their time with us here. And so with that, thanks so much, Kent and David, for being with us today. Excellent. Thanks so much, James. Thanks Absolutely. so much, Kent. Always a pleasure. So with that, thanks so much, folks, for hanging out with us. And as mentioned, our speakers' links are in the description. So if you want to hear more, you can hear more. And keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable.